<laughs> okay. Uh, hello, everybody. Glad there's a good turnout for, I don't know if this is the eighth or ninth Red History Lecture series, which I give here on either obscure, neglected, or unusual, just left wing communist topics. Everything from Blanqui to um, Tanya Bunk and beyond. And today uh, is communist resistance in Nazi Germany, which uh, is certainly uh, something that doesn't get too much talked about. And I just want to warn you in advance, there's a lot of facts and figures in this talk, and it is rather long, but that's just the nature of the talk. But we're all smart people, we can all listen, and it's being taped if you really want to actually watch it again. So, without further ado, uh, communist resistance. So, in 1943, a member of the German Communist Party, who was sentenced to die for resistance activities as part of the underground espionage group Red Orchestra, wrote these final words to his father, and I quote, Be strong. I am dying as I live, as a fighter in the class war. It is easy to call yourself a communist as long as you don't have to shed blood for it. You only show whether you are really one when the hour comes when you have to prove yourself. I am one father. The war won't last much longer, and your hour will have come. Think of all those who've already traveled down this road, that I must go down today, and will still have to travel down it, and learn one thing from the Nazis. Every weakness will have to be paid for with blood. So be merciless, remain hard. And I think these words express the spirit that animated thousands of communist resistors to Hitler, a hardened sense of responsibility, militant anti-fascism, and a readiness to sacrifice everything. It is a chapter of our history which too many Marxists and communists have either forgotten or don't care to tell. And if nothing else, I want to tell this story of communist resistance against all the odds. From 1933 through 1945, the Communist Party of Germany maintained the most sustained resistance to Nazism. And as a result, at least 25,000 party members were killed, up to 30,000. While there were plenty of heroes and martyrs among the communist resistance in Nazi Germany, the party did make a number of deadly mistakes both before Hitler's rise to power and afterwards. And we need to ask ourselves what these errors were and to understand them in order to utilize these lessons for current struggles. Before discussing the communist resistance, we should step back and ask exactly how the Nazis were able to come to power, and I'm not going to go back to 1919, but to go back to 1929, at the high point of Germany's Weimar Republic. 1929 was the fifth year of what had been termed the golden 20s of robust economic growth, social reforms, a cultural renaissance, and political stability in Germany. It appeared that the era of civil unrest and financial collapse which marked the early years of Weimar was a thing of the past. However, German stability came to a sudden end with the onset of the Great Depression. The stock market crash, which began in the United States, had repercussions which echoed around the world, nowhere more so than in Germany. After 1923, the German economy had recovered due to American loans, which were withdrawn by U.S. banks after the crash. The withdrawal of these loans caused the economy to collapse. To give an idea of the scope of the German catastrophe, here are some figures. In 1928, 8.4% of the workforce, or 1.25 million people, were unemployed. In 1932, more than 30% of the workforce, or approximately 6.5 million people, were unemployed. And these figures do not give the full picture, since because many of those who still had jobs were now working part-time, and those who had full-time jobs saw their wages go down. And industrial production, fell from a base of 100 in 1928 to 59 in August of 1932. The only country I can think that's actually comparable to these figures is actually the United States. And the Great Depression in turn brought massive political instability to Germany. Although there have been chronic economic problems in the previous five years, notably in agriculture and there was labor unrest, to the German ruling class these appeared manageable since this was an era of tacit compromise between the bourgeoisie and the reformist labor movement led by the SPD, or the Social Democrats. The Social Democrats had been willing to forego any attempt at socialism in order to integrate the working class into Weimar's democratic capitalism in return for various social welfare provisions such as in unemployment. 
the dominant factions of the bourgeoisie, accepted this compromise in order to protect their interests and to use the Social Democrats to maintain control over the working class. During the Roaring Twenties, it was quite possible for the state to fund the Social Democrats' unemployment programs and other social provisions since profits were coming in. However, the Depression meant that the influx of capital was cut off, creating a major fiscal crisis for the state and reducing levels of profitability for the bourgeoisie. Attempts by the capitalist parties in the Reichstag to cut unemployment benefits met with resistance from the SPD, leading to the resignation of the government in March 1930. From this time forward, no government had majority support in the Reichstag, leading to a constitutional impasse and a deadlock in the decision-making process at the highest levels. Essentially, the difference between the SPD and the dominant factions of the capitalist class amounted to this, in terms of the crisis anyway. The SPD believed that the economic recovery should not be accomplished on the backs of those who suffered immediate hardship, while the capitalists believed that the high cost of unemployment benefits and social provisions prevented economic recovery and the restoration of profitability. The success of Reichstag chancellors, who were increasingly ruling by decree, began to launch major attacks on the conditions of the proletariat and the middle classes, such as slashing wages, but they could not overcome the economic crisis or restore profitability. However, the response of the Social Democrats was not to lead a mass struggle of the working class against these austerity cuts. Rather, they stressed constitutionalism and respect for legality, which led the Social Democrats to follow a policy of toleration towards the various Reichstag governments. In effect, the Social Democrats were saying that they had no alternative path for the German workers, just more hardship. And their advocacy of legality meant that the potential Social Democratic base compromising millions of workers including a paramilitary wing known as the Reichsbanner, was never mobilized. The lack of legitimacy for the, the measures of the government and the worsening crisis led millions of Germans to look for solutions. And the first force which we will focus is on the grossly misnamed National Socialist German Workers' Party, the Nazis, led by Adolf Hitler. Even though the Nazis had anti-capitalist planks in their program, we should look more closely at what they did rather than what they said. The Nazis were a violently fascist, anti-communist, ultra-nationalist, racist, anti-Semitic, and imperialist organization, as completely proven by their own practice. The German communists were quite aware that the Nazis were their most deadly enemies, while the capitalists came to see them as potential saviors of their system. And as the Nazis moved closer to power, they ditched the anti-capitalist portion of their program, and in 1934 approached the radical, yeah, radical like that, elements among the stormtroopers during the Night of the Long Knives. The Nazis did possess working class members, as did all German parties. However, the Nazis were predominantly a, a petty bourgeoisie and bourgeoisie party, with these elements overrepresented in their ranks when compared to the general population. By contrast, working members were underrepresented among Nazis as compared to the general population. The Nazis were overwhelmingly young. More than four-fifths of their members were under 29 years of age. And there was a large number of unemployed in their ranks. For instance, 70% of the stormtroopers <coughs> lacked a job. The Nazis didn't, did have their own factory cells among the working class, but they numbered about 294,000 members in 1933, which were out dwarfed by all the other uh, sections of the, the labor movement. Before the Depression, the Nazis were a small and marginalized party, winning only 2.6% of the votes and 12 seasons of the Reichstag elections of 1928. However, in September of 1930, the Nazi vote shot up, and they became the second largest party, with 18.3% of the vote and 107 seats in the Reichstag. In July 1932, the Nazis won their highest to vote total in a free election of 37.3%, or 13.7 million voters, and 230 seats. And in November of that same year, their vote went down slightly to 33% and 196 Reichstag seats. And despite the drop in Nazi votes, in January 1933, Hitler was appointed chancellor. And within months, all other political parties were banned and the Nazis gained absolute power. So how did this happen? Well, for one, the ruling class was divided with its various industrial and financial sectors opposed to the Junkers, or landed property owners, Manufacturing sectors opposed to heavy industry, mid-level employers wanted to negotiate a compromise with the working class, and large employers desirous of crushing the working class and gaining it total power and profits. 
Furthermore, the parties which represented the ruling class in the Reichstag no longer possessed any mass legitimacy, which meant that if a new political and economic program to restore profitability was to be implemented, then they needed to broaden their base of support. Now, the, before the crisis, the German ruling class did not need fascism. They essentially hedged their bets, trying different forms of non-socialist electoral formations to keep both the socialists and the communists out of power and to maintain their rule. However, after the crash, as misery spread and profit sank, the situation grew increasingly desperate. Electoral support for the bourgeois, old bourgeoisie parties dwindled, and the communists grew ever more militant. At the same time, the Nazi vote grew, and they increasingly appeared as a non-democratic and non-socialist alternative to Weimar. The Nazis endeared themselves to the bourgeoisie as their paramilitaries killed communist organizers and striking workers in the streets. The Nazis offered the mass base which the German ruling class needed in order to stabilize capitalism and to lead the way out of economic and political crisis, along with repressing the left. After the Nazi vote dropped slightly in late 1932, it appeared they were more controllable and moving in a moderate direction. So a deal was struck between the Nazis and the German capitalists, primarily the political leaders in the Reichstag, in order to bring Hitler to power. However, Hitler was not just another aspiring politician, and he wanted absolute power. And neither the capitalist class nor the army opposed him, since they saw a clear overlap of the, between their interests and the Nazis. Hitler was able to outmaneuver his opponents, destroy the organizations of the working class, and institute a Nazi dictatorship. And this brings us to the German Communist Party, or the KPD, which I'll use interchangeably, which was the only other political party to grow during the Depression in Germany. The KPD was rightfully recognized by both its friends and opponents as a revolutionary communist organization. The party had tried at least three times to overthrow the Weimar Republic during the period from 1919 through 1923 and establish a Soviet Republic. During the Depression, the party attracted many young people, and both its overall membership and its vote increased. For example, in 19, the 1928 elections, the KPD numbered approximately 124,000 members and received 3.2 million votes, or 10.6% of the total, and 54 Reichstag seats. In 1930, the KPD received 4.6 million votes, 13% of the total, and gained 77 Reichstag seats. And in November 1932, uh, the KPD vote was 5.9 million, 17% of the total, and 100 Reichstag seats. And by the time Hitler took power, that the party had approximately 350,000 members. And while the party maintained a solid core of the organized working class, we should clarify exactly what this meant. The onset of the Depression meant that the membership of the KPD was more unemployed workers than those who were employed. For instance, in 1928, 62% of party members were factory workers, and by 1932, this figure dropped to about 20%. According to some scholars, uh, unemployment party members comprised upwards of 90% in 1932, some scholars. Uh, a comparative statistic for the United States Communist Party, roughly 32 or 34, is 60 to 7% unemployed. And at least, again, depending on who you're reading, at least 20% of the membership consisted of skilled workers. This lack of a base among the employed meant that the Communist Party was only able to win 4% of the vote in factory committees in 1932, against 84% for the Social Democrats. And even before the beginning of the Great Depression, the Communist Party had been leading the fight in a number of labor struggles across Germany. And on May Day 1929, uh, immortalized in a, a novel called Barricades in Berlin, I believe, the Communist Party led a demonstration in Berlin, which was fired upon by the Social Democratic Controlled Police Force. And the result was 25 deaths, and this only uh, further divided the two parties. The Depression not only brought greater influence to the party, but seemed to be a confirmation to their members that the final crisis of capitalism was at hand. There were a, a number of major eruptions in the class struggle in the Depression. For instance, in the first week of 1932, there were strikes in Berlin, the Ruhr, and Hamburg. By September, October of that, of that year, there were 500 major labor disputes. Most of these were in response to government austerity measures and many of those strikes were successful. And there were a growing number of clashes between the Nazis and the communists. Just as the Nazis had their own parallel military wing, the SA, the communists had the League of Red Front Fighters, which numbered approximately 100,000. The fights between these groups grew increasingly bloody. Both sides had their own territory, 
territory that neither could enter without incurring casualties. Nazis would not dare enter working class strongholds such as uh, Red, the Red Wedding District in Berlin. As the fighting between the two sides increased, the government actually banned the Red Front but did not ban the SA. And despite this level of support and militancy, the Communist Party was not able to halt the rise of the Nazis. Following the Reichstag fire, which the Communists were blamed for, which but they didn't do, the Nazis, uh, the party was banned and driven underground. So how do we explain this defeat for the Communists? To answer this, let us step back and elaborate some potential answers. Among the reasons generally claimed for the defeat of the party is their strategy uh, during the third period promoted by the Communist International, the Comintern, during the Depression. The third period claimed that the end of capitalism was at hand and the Communist Revolution was on the agenda. This line is said to have prevented a united front from developing between the party and the SPD, which led the working class, which split the working class in the face of the fascist threat. And as part of this line, the, the party claimed the, that the Social Democrats were not a working class socialist party of reformist politics, but social fascists were basically indistinguishable from the Nazis. Thus, the Communist Party directed the majority of their attacks against the Social Democrats and thereby prevented the emergence of the United Front, which could have stopped Hitler's rise to power. Now, there are some things to unpack about this. Number one, even the harshest communist critics of the Comintern line on, this, on social fascism, such as Trotsky or August Thelemer, never claimed that the SPD was not a counter-revolutionary reformist party. The SPD had shown through its practice that they did not want either socialism or revolution, that they did not care about illegality unless it came to commanded right-wing death squads which murdered communist organizers in 1919. And they opposed every communist effort to make, take power, and they had fired upon the May Day demonstrators in 1929. And as well, it's true that KPD had made several proposals to ally with the SPD against the Nazis. The SPD did refuse to work them. We should not overlook that the SPD deserves a great deal of blame for the failure to resist Nazism. Their leadership had preached constitutionalism and legality as opposed to extra-parliamentary action. And when the Nazis took power in January of 1933, the SPD actually said that they had taken power legally. Essentially, the Social Democrats worked to prevent any form of premature resistance to the Nazis. And too often, communist criticism of the Social Democrats, especially of their leadership, their failing to fight the Nazis is mis misplaced. The Social Democrats would not act like revolutionaries and communists because they were Social Democrats. The, S the, the Communist Party's official policy was a united front below, from below, which meant they want to win over the Social Democrat rank and file to Communist leadership. To many uh, Social Democrats, the united front from below looked like a cynical ploy on the part of the Communists, uh, which is essentially they would say, you can only work with us if you denounce your own party and leadership. Furthermore, the blanket attacks by the Communists on all Social Democrats uh, was not just limited to the, the leadership, but actually went down to uh, school children and was not going to win them any allies in that front. Also, the communists, along with the Nazis, had voted to bring down the Social Democratic government in Prussia in 1932, right. which uh, was not going to appeal them to the rank and file Social Democrat. And in line with the third period, the Communist Party had abandoned all mainstream trade unions and worker organizations not led by them, forming their own revolutionary unions and cutting themselves off from potential support. And this led the party to pursue rather adventurous tactics in a multitude of industrial disputes. They called seven failed general strikes from the Depression through 1932. And the Red Front street fighting with the Nazis was done more uh, as individualistic actions as opposed to any form of mass action. And despite all the communist talk of revolution and seizing power, they really actually had no plan to take it. The Comintern line of a catastrophic collapse of capitalism actually encouraged a rather passive fatalism in the party. As a result of the laws of history, they were destined to inherit power. It could be said that the leadership of the Communist Party underestimated the danger of a Nazi victory, believing it would be of short duration, and that it would not, and that Hitler would not last long to be soon followed by uh, the, the rise of the Communist power. And as it would turn out, the Communist Party tur uh, turned out to be very mistaken in that. To sum up, the Communists failed because they had a mechanical and economist view of the crisis, a lack of strategy to seize power, and were isolated. The party did have a militant base, but is limited to a minority among the working class, particularly those who are unemployed. And the party believed that they couldn't act and take power until they went over the base of the Social Democrats. But in many respects, they hadn't thought exactly how to do this effectively, and their tactics were counterproductive. The party was paralyzed by an apocalyptic expectation that capitalism was just going to collapse, and they could never translate this into a strategy 
for revolutionary anti-fascist action. And considering that the German party both failed and was defeated in 1933, it is worth looking at an alternative strategy to the common turn. And there have been several different strategies proposed, both in Germany and elsewhere, and the best known was that put forward by Trotsky during the early 1930s, which uh, I'll elaborate here. Now, Trotsky had warned of the fascist danger, declaring, uh, this is actually in regards to France, but it applies here as well, the historic function of fascism is to smash the working class, destroy its organizations, and stifle political liberties when the capitalists find themselves unable to govern and dominate with the help of democratic machinery. And in contrast to the common turn, which said that the final crisis of capitalism was upon us, Trotsky argued the contrary, that the problem in Germany does not arise at the conclusion of the revolutionary crisis, but just at its approach. It goes on and states that the German party did not come upon the scene yesterday, nor the day before. In 1923, it had behind it openly or in a semi-concealed form the majority of the working class. In 1924, on the ebbing wave, it received 3.6 million votes, a greater percentage of the working class than at present. This means that these, those workers who remain with the social democracy, as well as those who voted this time with, for the National Socialists, did, so out of simple, did not do so out of simple ignorance, nor because they had awakened only yesterday, not because they had as yet no chance to know what the Communist Party is, but because they have no faith on the basis of their own experience in the recent years. In other words, uh, Trotsky says the failures of the German party in its recent past weakened its ability to fight fascism. When Trotsky agreed with the party that they could not comp conquer capitalism or fascism without the support of the masses. He knew that the majority of the masses of workers followed the Social Democrats, and it was necessary to win them over to the anti-fascist struggle. And he believed it impossible to encourage the Social Democratic masses when they were denounced as twins of fascism. In contrast to the common term, which only contemplated a united front from below, Trotsky proposed a united front from below and with the Social Democratic leadership. And for the United Front to operate effectively, Trotsky believed had to include the following. A rejection of defeatism, in other words, the victory of fascism is not inevitable. A rejection of ultimatums, such as demanding that the Social Democrats, the Democrats break with their leadership as a precondition for joint action. Rather, there should be proposals to the leadership and the base. A focus on extra-parliamentary fascism. Fascism would not be barred at the ballot box, but by the masses in the streets. A concentration on direct actions which aimed at mobilizing the masses, supported by organizations of the proletariat, with the final goal as the revolutionary general strike and the seizure of power. Trotsky believed that if the communists put forward these principled and consistent proposals for a determined fight against fascism to the masses, it would also serve to expose the social democrats for their lack of a program and will to resist, which in turn would lead them to communism. Now, Trotsky also believed that there would be no chance of stopping fascism as long as the communists saw the Social Democrats as the main danger that needed to be defeated before fascists could be tackled. And if the Social Democrats remained bound to legality and refused to unite with the agents of Moscow. In other words, without a united front of the working class, and if instead there was disunity and the current strategy was followed, there would be disorientation, paralysis, and defeat. And at the end of a 1931 article calling for a workers' united front, Trotsky warned, Worker communists, you are hundreds of thousands, millions. You cannot leave for any place. There are not enough passports for you. Should fascism come to power, it will ride over your skulls and spines like a terrific tank. Your salvation lies in merciless struggle, and only a fighting unity with the social democratic workers can bring victory. In case, worker communists, you have very little time left. However, this is to deny, and this is, a, I think, a, a reasonable summation of Trotsky's uh, alternative to the common turn. But this does not necessarily mean that if a different strategy, such as those proposed of, uh, by Trotsky, was followed, that defeat could have been avoided. Perhaps the best that could have happened was that the Nazis still would have come to power, but facing maybe greater resistance or even civil war. Maybe nothing ultimate would change. And maybe, but it is, of course, possible uh, that the Nazis could have been stopped. We cannot actually rewind history and redo those events. Yet the fact that the, the party did not ultimately stop the Nazis was both humiliating and demoralizing. If the end result is the same, I would argue, it is better to fight a losing battle rather than to surrender without engaging in struggle. And when German communist Rosa Levine Mayer said in regards to the defeat of 1923, applies, I think, in certain respects to 1933. Retreat may have been inevitable, she said, but, such a catastrophe, but not such a catastrophic and defenseless retreat. The workers were never able to find out by their own experience whether the revolution was betrayed or whether they lost the battle in a square fight. 
not yet being strong enough to achieve their goal. They felt humiliated and cheated, end quote. Now, whatever the mistakes of the co Communist Party, and they were not minor, we should not forget that they were not ultimately responsible for the rise of the Nazis to power. Rather, the blame clearly belongs on the ruling classes of Germany, who were both quite willing to sacrifice the Weimar Republic, so long as the left was placed under the jack boot, law and order restored, and profits protected. Now, with the rise of the Nazis to power, democratic liberties were abolished, the left and the organized working class was crushed, atomized, and imprisoned. So what did national socialism in power mean for the workers? For one, the economy was geared toward war as military spending jumped from 2% of national income in 1932 to 32% in 1938. And for the working class, real wages dropped under Nazism and profits for the ruling class sharply rose. According to one uh, activist, uh, Ernest Mendel, before the Second World War, the real wages of the German worker under National Socialism had already fallen by more than 10% as compared with the pre-war crisis, despite a considerable rise in production. In 1938, production was 25% above the 1929 level, and the rise in the average productivity in 1938 was approximately 10% higher than in 1929, achieved under Nazi rule and that the mass of profits shot upwards from uh, approximately 15.4 million Reichmarks in 1929 to uh, 8 billion Reichmarks in 1932 to approximately 20 billion Reichmarks in 1938. And these were, uh, figures refer to all forms of profits, including commercial and bank profits. And so if Hitler was a socialist, he was the worst socialist ever. So what was the response of the working class to the Nazi dictatorship? Well, there was resistance from other quarters, such as conservatives and reactionaries, which would coalesce in the Stauffenberg bomb plot of 1944, along with youth groups and Jews. The organized working class, with their tradition of struggle and organization, was a constant concern for the Nazis. This is not to say that workers didn't cooperate or accept Nazi rule at varying levels. They did. Nor is it to say that the working class always took a principled stand and heroic stand against the Nazis. They didn't. However, a number of factors weakened working class resistance to the Nazis. One was clearly repression. If you were openly Nazi, the Discapo was going to arrest you and send you to concentration camp. The fear of punishment or even death caused many workers to keep their heads low. Secondly, the Nazi arrests of uh, left and trade union leaders caused disorientation among the workers, which led to apathy. Thirdly, there was the onset of full employment, which was welcome to many of the unemployed. Fourthly, the, the Nazis fostered divisions in the working class. For example, during the war, Germans received higher pay, better conditions and rations, as opposed to foreign workers and certainly compared to slave workers. The imposition of foreign laborers and slaves during the war was also done so that the costs of war would not be borne by German workers and would forestall any potential rebellion. <coughs> Still, there was resistance among German workers. The Nazis created their own labor front, which did not represent the working class. It was impossible to run as an anti-Nazi in the elections to the German labor front. Discontent could be seen by the number of no votes for a Nazi candidate or abstention. In a number of cases, workers engaged in stoppages or slowdowns in order to win higher wages. And there were a few re reported cases of worker sabotage and refusal to contribute to social programs such as Nazi winter relief. And the Nazis also wanted to exploit, who wanted to exploit workers to the maximum, were careful to ensure they didn't spark generalized unrest. In 1939, when the Nazis tried to reduce wages, and abolished bonuses, there was so much resistance among workers that this proposal was withdrawn. And while Hitler's foreign policy successes and German victories during World War II did increase support for the government, the defeat at Stalingrad led to a growth of resistance, and living standards were maintained until quite late in the war in order to prevent a repeat of the revolution of 1918. The Nazis remembered that it had been a working class revolution which had overthrown the Kaiser at the end of World War I, and they did not want to repeat that. And as the war dragged on and Germany came closer to defeat, working class living standards did fall, work hours did go up. Yet that does not necessarily mean that there was an increase of resistance. There's also depression, apathy, and even a rallying to the regime. As Germany was bombed, for instance, many workers labored to increase productivity and to report, uh, repair damaged facilities. Now let's return to the uh, Communist Party when Hitler came to power. The Communist Party in 33 possessed, again, over 300,000 members, and they suffered heavily in concentration camps, but they still managed to organize resistance even there. 
After Hitler was granted emergency powers, at least 10,000 members were arrested and sent to camps. And in 1935, 14,000 members were arrested. In 1936, approximately 11,000. And over 8,000 in 1937, and almost 4,000 in 1938. And the first victims of Nazi repression were the communists and other sectors of the left, as the poem by Martin Nuh no more uh, clearly recognized. First, they came for the communists. So again, not the socialists, not the Jews, unless they're already communists, not the conservatives, and never the capitalists. The first concentration camp at Dachau was created specifically to hold political prisoners. It would soon be followed by others across Germany. In the camps, communists and other left inmates were actually forced to wear a red triangle. Uh, well imprisoned inmates were tortured, beaten, and forced to beg for their lives. In order to be let out of jail, they had to renounce their beliefs. And there were stories of escape and resistance in the camps. For instance, former Reichstag deputy Hans Beimler managed to escape from Dachau by strangling his guard, stealing his uniform, and walking out the door. And despite risks involved, the communists were able to maintain their organization and continue political education among members. At Ravensbrück concentration camp, the inmates conducted educational classes using contraband copies of the History of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, the short course. In other camps, communists managed to smuggle in copies of Lenin and Kautsky, of all people, that were hidden from the SS. In one camp, German and Czech communist prisoners conducted a joint instructional class. In camps close to Berlin, prisoners somehow managed to establish contact with comrades at liberty, who in turn brought in leaflets and other materials. And the party also did collect dues in prison in the form of cigarettes. <laughs> 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 I don't know what they did with it, but there you go. Bribe the guards. Yeah, bribe the guards, essentially. <laughs> when the war began, the German camps began to fill up with prisoners from occupied Europe. And, of course, uh, among these were communists uh, and the, from the occupied countries, and they, both German and international communists, did see, uh, seek each other out. For example, communist Jews were able to make friendly contact with Aryan comrades and enjoy their protection when compared to non-political Jews. There was conflict as well. There was some chauvinism on the part of German communists, an apathy or hatred among from communists of other national groups, uh, which was directed at all Germans, including members of the party. Every group of prison in, in the camps did assist their own members, and this was certainly true of the communists as well. Self-protection was done to protect members from harassment and terror from the administrators and the guards. Those who were viewed as enemies of the communist party could suffer from their wrath. There's bad blood, of course, between the party and the prison Trotskyists. Although there were other cases of Trotskyists and communists who did manage to work together. Now I'd like to turn to a really interesting example of communists at Buchenwald concentration camp. At Buchenwald, communists made up approximately a third of the 20,000 prisoners at the camp. To help the Nazis keep order in the camp, certain tasks of the administration of the prison were done by the prisoners. Initially, this was done by criminal prisoners who were preferred by the SS for their brutality. However, communists eventually took over these roles. And to strengthen camp, uh, camp cohesion and as a display of internationalism, they made sure that, the, that functionaries came from every country who was imprisoned in the camp, along with promoting cooperation with social democrats and even liberal members of the middle class, especially, well, after 1935, anyway. And these administrative positions were precarious, and the officials were under constant risk of either losing them or being killed. Yet these positions also gave the communists some freedom of action, which they skillfully utilized to organize, and was a way to preserve the lives of their fellow prisoners. And the communist organization also established a parallel military organization with their own chain of command. And by 1943, this organization was a center of anti-Nazi activity in the camp. And on April 11, 1945, shortly before the American army entered the camp, the communist prisoners rose up, killed some of their guards, forced the rest to flee, and liberated the camp. And following the war, the Buchenwald People's Front Committee presented a resolution to the 21,000 survivors which demanded revolutionary measures take, be taken against Nazism, that business interests be nationalized, and to ultimately establish a people's republic. The communists and other prisoners also swore an oath, known as the Buchenwald Oath, which said, and I quote, we will take up the fight until the last culprit stands before the judges of the people. Our work, watchword is the destruction of Nazism from its roots. Our goal is to build a new world of peace and freedom. This is our responsibility to our murdered friends and their relatives. After the Buchenwald oath was read aloud, the prisoners raised their hands and said, We swear. 
By 1945, at least half of the party membership had either been imprisoned or suffered persecution. For the, again, further 25,000 were murdered by the Nazis. Among this number included communist leader Ernst Thalmann, 11 years in a solitary confinement and was murdered in August of 1944. To put this in a larger perspective, by 1945, we know that around 1 million Germans were sent to concentration camps during the whole period of the Third Reich, which means that the communists made up approximately 15% of those who were in prison. And during the first two years of the Third Reich, during going outside the camps, the party did manage to maintain an extraordinary level of resistance despite fearsome persecution. After 1933, many leading functionaries of the party left for exile in either the Soviet Union or Western Europe, but most members remained in Germany. And they were still animated by the common turn line that the resolution was on the horizon. According to one estimate, in 1935, at least 10% of the party remained active in some underground organization or another. Most of these members were either unemployed or skilled workers. The party hoped to organize ever more workers against the Nazis by leafleting, selling papers, extending their organizations, such as the Union Wing, and even organizing petition and demonstrations. For instance, in 1934, the party called for non-payment for gas, rent, and tax and electric bills. And the workers were urged to march on town halls. The workers did not heed the communist calls, and such action would have led to mass repression by the Gestapo. According to one account, 1.5 million pro-communist leaflets were smuggled into Germany in 1934. And in 1935, 1 1.65 million copies of communist literature were seized. And the party maintained its old centralized structure, collecting dues, keeping membership lists, providing detailed accounts of the exile leadership of both their successes and their failures. And this reproach ended up assisting the Gestapo who were able to use this information and track down and arrest thousands of party members. A side effect of this was that the KPD's excessive, uh, extensive records on Trotskyists, who they kept a very close eye on, did fall into the hands of the Nazis, who in turn arrested them. The party also denounced the racist Nuremberg laws and the pogrom of Kristallnacht, declaring after the latter in the leaflet, before all, of man all mankind, the owner of Germany has been covered with the deepest disgrace. Help our tormented Jewish fellow citizens in whatever way possible. Wall into isolation the deep despised anti-Semitic rabble from our people. Show solidarity through sympathy and help for our Jewish comrades. And the Discapa was forced to admit in a report the self-sacrificing readiness of all the supports of the illegal co Communist Party who were on every occasion ready to fill any gap which occurred in their ranks. Convinced Communists again and again sacrificed their lives to avoid having to betray their comrades. And despite the heroic, some might say suicidal, level of resistance by the party, the disastrous consequences of its underground approach and the third period generally led to a reevaluation in 1934 and 35 by the Comintern. The party was uh, encouraged to infiltrate the Nazi labor front to agitate and recruit. Yet this left the party itself open to agent provocators from the Jaskapu and, and incurred hostility from the Social Democrats who viewed them as collaborators. Another major line occurred in 35 when the Comintern moved from the third period and developed the line of the Popular Front. And the Popular Front said that communists needed to seek unity with socialists, liberals, even conservative bourgeoisie, provided they were anti-fascists, in order to resist fascism and protect democracy. In events, essence, to the Popular Front meant the abandonment of proletariat revolution for the, for the duration and a complete reversal of positions in regard to social democracy. In Germany, the party dropped the demand for socialism and sought to build anti-fascist unity with other forces centered around the demand for a new democratic republic that would, of course, exclude any Nazis. The party made four proposals for joint action with the Social Democrats, all of which were rejected. The Social Democrats could justify their re rejection by pointing to the sudden uh, shift in the communist line, and the Social Democrats also believed that allying with the communists would alienate the middle classes, and Social Democrats were also less willing to collaborate with the Communist Party due to Soviet activities in Spain and the purges developing in Russia at that time. And ironically, many German communists uh, who did defend the purges that there, and some who were exiled in Germany, in Russia, were arrested, including Heinz Neumann, leaders of the Red Front, and other party officials and writers. In regards to the Spanish Civil War, following Franco's military coup, Germany and Italy came to its aid with arms and troops. In response to this, the Comintern organized the International Brigades, which composed approximately 40,000 volunteers from more than 50 countries to defend the Spanish Republic from fascism. 
And depending on who you read, it's either 3,000 or 5,000 German and Austrian socialists and communists, including Hans Beimler, Walter Ulbrich, William, Willy Brandt, Ludwig Renn, and Hans Kehler were organized in the Thalmann Battalion, named for the imprisoned leader of the party. The Thalmans were used as shock troops during the crucial battle for Madrid in 1936, and the battalion fought at a number of engagements in the Civil War, such as at Las Rosas in um, January 1937 and of several others. In a less than honorable moment in their history, in May 1937, following uh, fighting in Barcelona, several members of the battalion were actually used as part of an operation to stage the kidnapping of Pum leader Andres Nin, then in Soviet custody, to make it look like he was a fascist agent. But that was a very small number of their, their forces. At war's end, only about 20,000 members of the, of the battalion survived, and many of them faced a grim future in exile, French and German camps, and some later falling into the hands of the Gestapo. And during the Spanish Civil War, there, I did, this was kind of interesting, there were a group of Trotskys in Germany, the German city of Danzig, who wrote leaflets which were distributed to dock workers, urging them not to deliver supplies to the nationalists. And the Communist Party had to endure a change of line in 1939 when the Molotov-Ribbentrop non-aggression pact was signed between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. And this pact did result in what I would say is one of the most shameful history, uh, episodes of communist history when the USSR handed over approximately 600 exiled communists, many of them Jews, back to Germany, most of whom were subsequently killed. And the party was shocked at the signing of the pact and didn't immediately grasp its implications. Ultimately, the, the KPT, in line with Soviet policy, upheld the pact, yet there were certain uh, contradictions in its stance. On the one hand, the party hoped for toleration or even legalization by the Nazis, but they also did put out propaganda stating, still, that the main enemy was at home, following Karl Liebknecht. Following the outbreak of war, the party's lines of communication were cut, and most of its organizations in Germany were isolated. Needless to say, resistance reached a low in 1941, with only 62 anti-Nazi leaflets seized by the Gestapo, and arrests of communists reached their lowest point. However, the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941 removed any doubts and caused the party to move into a more active resistance stance. To give an example, in October of 41, the Gestapo seized more than 10,000 anti-Nazi leaflets. There were also a number of underground communist cells in Germany which sprouted up, not all of them necessarily connected to the party. I'd like to go into some of these. One cell in Berlin lasting in 41 through 42 consisted of 100 members and painted anti-Nazi graffiti on buildings and encouraged worker sabotage. The group managed to publish its own paper telling the truth about the war and exposing Nazi crimes. Ultimately, this group was broken up by the Nazis and who arrested and executed most of their members, although there some cells survived in other Berlin factories. Another cell called the Home Front was active in Berlin and Hamburg. Its members worked to create anti-Nazi public opinion. They survived until 42 when the Dishkapu arrested their leading members. There was another group led by a really interesting figure called Josef Beppo Romer, who is an ex-member of the far-right Fry Corps that had suppressed the Bavarian Soviet Republic in 1919, joined the party in the 30s, and was now organizing workplace cells and planning to assassinate Hitler. However, the opportunity never presented itself, and his organization was infiltrated by the Gestapo in 42, and he was himself arrested in 1944. And one group of approximately 30 pro-communist Jews, led by Herbert Baum, encouraged German soldiers to overthrow Hitler. Yet the most spectacular action by this group occurred in May of 1942, when they broke into an anti-Soviet exhibit being put on by the Ministry of Propaganda, and they turned it into an anti-Nazi one. <laughs> However, one of their members was a police agent who informed on them, leading to mass arrests, torture, and executions. Overall, despite the heroic actions of individuals and small groups, the activity of the German party as a whole remained disorganized and uncoordinated. Cent uh, member of the Central Committee, Wilhelm Kochnell, I think, believed that Moscow overestimated the resistance potential of the KPD. And he argued that while the situation was right for political propaganda, the Nazis made great inroads among the population, and that the working class was atomized in large resistance Large-scale resistance was not possible when compared to, say, France or Italy at that time. The party did know of the plot by Stauffenberg and other plotters to kill Hitler and actually attempted to reach out to them. There was some attempt at negotiation between the plotters and the communists, but the Nazis got wind of these clandestine meetings and arrested those who had taken part. And at the end result, there was actually no collaboration between the two. There were two final communist resistance groups I'd like to focus on. Uh, one is not strictly a German communist 
organization, rather, it was a Soviet intelligence operation, popularly known as the Red Orchestra, with communists of many nationalities, including Germans, as members. This espionage ring, or rings, there are actually several groups, operated in occupied Europe and within Germany, possessing contacts in the Army High Command and in various government ministries. Before the various Red Orchestra groups were finally broken up by the Gestapo in 1943, they managed to provide key intelligence to the Soviet Union, which ultimately probably enabled them to win the war. One was knowledge that the Japanese would not attack the Soviet Union in December of 1941, allowing the Red Army to move fresh soldiers to defend Moscow. Two, the plans for Operation, the Operation Blue Offensive into the Caucasus region in 1942, which ultimately allowed the Red Army to win at Stalingrad. Three, delivering German battle plans for Operation Citadel, which allowed the Red Army to win the Battle of Kursk. And Red Orchestra's intelligence was so effective that German uh, battle plans generally reached the Red Army before the Wehrmacht in the field. <laughs> Lastly, German communists were involved in a Soviet-sponsored organization uh, called the National Committee for a Free Germany. The committee was an anti-Nazi organization made up of captured German soldiers, officers on the Eastern Front, and exiled communists living in Russia. Their mission was to encourage German soldiers to defect and to spread anti-Nazi messages among POWs. Some members fought with Soviet partisan units. The committee published a number of papers and leaflets along with operating their own radio station. Although the committee did not cause mass desertions on the Eastern Front, many members later played key roles in the establishment of the German Democratic Republic or East Germany. Even though there was an upsurge of communist resistance after the war began with the Soviet Union, the Dishkapo clamped down hard and the, the underground organization still remained scattered and isolated. Yet following the Soviet victory at Stalingrad, it did dawn on, on many Germans that the Third Reich was on the road to ruin, and this did ultimately coalesce into the Stauffenberg bomb plot to assassinate Hitler and negotiate a separate peace. Following the bomb plot, there was a further crackdown by the Nazis against all Mueller's suspected dissidents, and again on August 18, 1942, uh, 44, uh, Ernst Thalmann along with 24 former communist Reichstag deputies were executed. And until the end of the war, the communists remained hunted and killed by the Gestapo. And after the end of the, the Third Reich, of course, the party emerged from the underground. And the war's end also saw a very interesting episode that's very, not very much reported when more than 500 anti-fascist committees developed out of the ruins of Germany. And these committees composed workers and political prisoners, and they were determined to wipe out the last vestiges of Nazis in Germany. Many committees organized in factories. Strikes were launched, demanding a purge of Nazi officials. German labor front buildings were taken over. In concentration camp, victims were given shelter in the homes of Nazi activists. And in Stuttgart, the anti-fascist committees organized their own revolutionary tribunals for Nazi officials. However, the Allied military forces banned these committees and sought to foster rather conservative demo democratic forces, as opposed to resurgent left, which would threaten private property. These committees did exist in the Soviet zone as well, but they were quickly absorbed into the governmental apparatus of the Democratic Republic there. So in conclusion, in the capitalist world after World War II, the memory of communist resistance to Nazism was either minimized at best or denied at worst. To apologists of capitalism, communism and Nazism were seen as two sides of the same totalitarian coin. Yet history tells us something different. German communists, despite a multitude of mistakes and false paths, did resist the Nazis from beginning until the end. For them, Nazism was not the same as communism. Rather, it was rightly perceived as their most deadly adversary, and they paid for that truth with their very lives, and we would do well not to forget it. Thank you. Comments, concerns, objections? Before we start, sure. Oh, uh, okay. Uh, the Center for Marxist Education. We have no corporate sponsors, as uh, Nick always points out, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view. So uh, if you want, you can donate uh, some money here. And if you want to get on our email list for upcoming events, you can sign this uh, list here in the back. Yes, I all your stuff you're talking about, what's going on in Germany, it sounds reminiscent of what's going on in this country. There's a great distrust of the left. There's a great distrust of the left by the bourgeoisie radio stations. And there's a big, you can hear you know, on Fox, fascist news, Fox news, 
and his hostility with unions, with what the Nazis did. Any social group like us, like we go and well, how we protest for the community rights, we get mass resistance of, of the 99 percent. See, that's how the Nazis really did this. Did this what I say with sarcasm. Doctrination. Okay. Using the media to control the, control the minds. So I want to know we as socialists and communists, how are we going to combat that? I mean, I, it's, it's very sad that there'd be five of us at, at a protest on set, on set every Saturday night, every Saturday afternoon. And about five of us, I don't see many, including in this, in this, in this, in this, in this, well, in this meeting right now, nobody's out there. We're taking a stand against fascism. We can no longer. This is what the, this is what the Communist Party made a mistake in Germany. You know, they, they gained seats. But we have, and they, and they listened to Nazi propaganda. They should have took a more stand on Hitler. So what's, what's, the, what's this going to do with, with us today? Well, first we, of all, we went, well, hold on. Okay. Okay. we can no longer hide anymore. It's, it's not an option anymore. We have to go out in the streets because the fascists are making it perfectly clear they starting these wars like Hitler did. They want to cut austerity. We can no longer hide anymore. We have to go out in the street. If we don't do that, it's going to be Nazi Germany all over again. Yes. I, I'd suggest following up that um, I think if fascism comes to the United States, it's going to have a, a uniquely uh, bipartisan uh, flavor. I mean, we have these uh, militias, we have uh, the Tea Party, we have uh, yeah. some really scary folks I've bumped into on Facebook and so forth. But we also have a national uh, policy of NSA and NDAA and, and uh, all of the legal uh, um, opportunities uh, for concentration camps and mass repression as well as mass surveillance are in place at the same time that a mass base, it, it, the beginnings of a mass base are out there. Um, I really think it's important that we develop and, and, and certainly uh, work uh, with the unions with all, all different kinds of organizations that, we, that we're active in um, to um, you know, organize. It's an organization that gives strength and I think within the mass movements there has to be a conscious left. Uh, there has to be uh, uh, um, a socialist alternative put out there, and I'm not pushing an organization. <laughs> I'm just saying that, that there has to be a, a counter thing. Uh, quite frankly, what the Democratic Party politicians are proposing to counter what the uh, Republicans or the Tea Party actually through the Republican Party is putting out there um, isn't uh, sharply, uh, clearly uh, an alternative uh, that uh, ordinary working folks uh, can can um, deal with. Uh, two days ago at the Mass Nurses Association convention, we had John Nichols. Um, a lot of folks know him from the nation, uh, uh, Progressive Democrats of America and so forth. And he gave a very fiery, terrific speech uh, centered around uh, the resistance in Wisconsin uh, to the governor there and, and, and to the uh, um, ALEC and all of that. He, he left a few things out. So the first chance I got, I rose to the podium. I mean, uh, he didn't mention uh, uh, Ferguson, Missouri, as a, as a prime example of uh, this long history of lynching in this country. And he didn't mention, uh, we, I think he may have mentioned in passing uh, endless wars, but he didn't uh, bring out the fact that we're uh, in, in, in a, a continuous uh, uh, state of militarism right. and, the, and how that impacts on us. So I. I I, I, I'm not saying you know break with uh, progressive Democrats, but I'm saying let's give some staunch leadership in ter on class questions and and, uh, and and really it's democracy that we're talking about and anti-imperialism whether we like the word or not. But I, I think those have to all be mixed in into everything we do. If we're fighting around health care, for example, uh, how, how do we make the connection uh, with the repression of the African American community? Uh, or with the, the war budget and, and, and the militarism and, and uh, uh, Ebola uh, connected with the deforestation and the corruption 
and the uh, presence of uh, U.S. boots on the ground all over Africa. Let's you know, let's make the connections and let's help those that we work with every day see those connections. Yes, John. Yeah, I thought it was a very good talk and gave a, a very rounded, uh, really, description and explanation of what was happening in, uh, in pre-Nazi Germany as well as Nazi Germany. Uh, I guess I'd like to just highlight one thing. The, the Communist Party uh, made, more or less made a, uh, an alliance with the Nazi Party, and I think it was 1931, if, if I'm not mistaken. You referred to it in your talk, uh, but it was specifically called the Red Referendum in Prussia, and it was, uh, you know, it was it was publicized around the Communist International as well. This referendum was a referendum to remove the social demo democratic government from power in Prussia, and uh, the Communist Party organized to. Uh, you know, jointly with the Nazis to to make this uh, referendum, you know, to bring this referendum to fruition. Uh, the referendum was lost, actually, and uh, the government, I believe it was anyway, you can correct me, and in 1930, you know, th this referendum in Prussia, uh, the Social Democrats were still, ma you know, remained in power there in Prussia, but it was a uh, you know, I think a, a devastating lesson, uh, essentially uh, you know, miseducated millions of people as to what the tasks of, uh, of working class uh, uh, opponents of Nazism, I mean, uh, that would demoralize and confuse everybody, it would seem to me, and, and definitely, uh, I think, greatly contributed to the defeat of, uh, or I should say to the victory of the Nazis uh, later on couple years later, but they called it a red referendum, you know, just... I mean, first of all, I think they actually were able to bring down the government. I'd have to double check that. But I would not cra classify it as an alliance. I mean, they had their own reasons, and yes, they did. At, at various times, the Communist Party did try and win over German or, or Nazi members, but I would not really call say they were actually an alliance with them. At the same time, they were still fighting and killing each other in the streets. That's one hell of an alliance. Why'd they call it a red referendum? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying it was... It, you can argue it's a mistake, but I would not call it an alliance between the two forces. That's that's my point. Yeah. Um, I, I appreciate the talk. Oh, thank you. As John does. And I'm so glad. I've been wanting to come down here, and I'm so glad to see so many people. This is a wonderful service to the community. Um, uh, the, the, the period you're talking about is very closely related to what's happening uh, today in the U.S., I think, and other people seem to be pointing to that. Um, so I, I'd like to draw a couple of things, try to do it very briefly, where, where I might differ with uh, some of the characterizations you used. So you described the Communist Party of Germany as a revolutionary party, and I understand that I come from a Trotskyist background. I'm in the Socialist Party now. Um, Trotsky viewed them as having uh, been revolutionary, revolutionary departure from the social democracy. And I, I just like to note that, that that could be challenged. That it was not a revolutionary departure. It was a, it was a departure against uh, the advice of Rosa Luxemburg, against the wishes that she expressed to maintain unity as long as possible. I understand. And a counter-revolutionary party is hard to have unity with. But on the other hand, in this country, the Comintern directed the communists here to depart from the Socialist Party, which was an anti-war party, disastrously, mm -hmm. disastrously. And so this is where this discussion of Germany comes right, right home to us. Right. The, the division of the German working class into two or three big parties can't compare with the division that we've got here. Right. We are the king of division in this country. Little groups that won't coordinate anything with each other. Right. Um, so I would like us to look further at this <coughs> the application here. It concerns me very much. I want us to, 
I want us to gather the left so so we don't all get sent to concentration camps uh, when the when the bad thing happens. And I guess I'll leave alone the um, Stalin's alliance, uh, Stalin's desire for a Hitler victory. But that's that's my view of it. The commun the Comintern was counter revolutionary, as was the Second International, in my view. But I'll I'll leave that for later. I mean, no just, I mean, just some comments, you know. Rosa Luxemburg can be wrong about a lot of things, too, let's be clear. And the fact is, I don't see, you know, she got outvoted. I mean, just because she said it didn't mean it was right, and those same people were shooting them in the streets a few weeks later. I mean, it's very hard to get over that, you know, that the Communist Party members in Berlin and in, in Bavaria were suddenly being executed by death squads organized by a social democratic government. I mean, one could say Trotsky was absolutely correct on this, but you'd have a hard time convincing your party self to ally with social democrats who had a history of killing your leadership. That's a very hard thing. Again, and, and that's not to say that different tactics couldn't have been used. And in terms of the party here, I mean, it really wasn't so much the common turn. There was like uh, uh, discontent anyway within the party. Like there was a very conservative executive within the Socialist Party of America. A lot of members were not willing to stand, you know, with the Russian Revolution, even though, and they used undemocratic tactics to essentially expel the various uh, radicals within the, the party. In terms of the United States, and I, I, I don't want to say too much about it just because other people I want to make sure have plenty of time to say. I mean, yes, we should work together where we can. I mean, we do have probably more than 57 varieties of leftism here, and um, uh, but we yeah we should work together. And a lot of some of these divisions are rather old, and they're maybe not where we should be uh, dividing on. We should unite where you know around concrete struggles and where possible. Yes. Oh, um, you with your hand. One thing was just a clarification. Sure. When you talked about the Thelma and you said yes. that Walter Ulbricht and Billy Brandt were in the same. Uh, they're, they're yeah, they the actually. Division. I mean, Billy Brett was never a communist. I know, I know, but it was, but he. No, I'm not asking. I know he wasn't in. The, he wasn't a communist, but he did go to Spain. Really? And there actually are writings of his okay. from his time in I never, Spain. I never saw him as being quite that rebel. What I knew about him. Maybe, maybe. I didn't think so either, but yeah. I yeah. double checked that. I'm like, oh, he went to Spain. The other thing I wanted to ask. Can about I add something about Billy? Hold on, uh, can the gentleman here. About Billy can can the gentleman here please? Sure. Yeah. I was asking if I could add something. Um, about uh, about. Uh, the, the uh, right stack fire. One of the prominent yeah. defendants who actually, I guess, was acquitted was uh, Dimitrov. Dimitrov. And he yeah. was sort of the one who, you can use the term, corrected the uh, common terms. Yes. Uh, 34, 35. So I was just wondering if you came across any yes, uh, information on how he uh, I mean, was they able were, to get acquitted, you know, in this, such a... I mean, eventually they, they had a trade, and he, like, Dimitrov embarrassed the Nazis so much that that's why Thalman was never put on trial again. They were not going to have any more communists turn the tables on them. And he some he like they made some deal with the Soviets. So he was really able to sort of turn into his court. Yes, he was essentially that's why like there was never any trial for a lot of these other communist leaders. And Dimitrov left and of course was the big hero and he's eventually the head of the common turn in thirty five. Right. Yes. But the comrade right in the back. I think Tilly um, had Tilly. So yeah, um, yeah I just was then Tilly. I thought it might be useful to interject something about Billy Brown. Yes, sure. Which was germane at at the time that we were talking about. But, so just on Billy Brandt, Billy Brandt was very close to Rudy Dutschka, who was a very important leader of the, of the New Left of the student movement in West Germany. And a young professor friend of mine at NYU who went to Chile and was involved in the Allende uh, years was arrested German. He was originally from East Berlin. He was taken off a train the day after the coup. And Rudy Dutschka Mine. Rudy Dutschko went to Billy Brown and said, our friend, uh, Klaus Meschka, is in the National Stadium, and you need to get him out. And Billy Brown intervened, and that may be why my friend is still alive and back in Germany. So Billy Brown had at least a few good points. Um, yeah. the, uh, what's interesting to me, and you may have already covered it or feel that you covered it, but it's been alluded to in a couple of other comments. And I don't know an awful lot about it, but there's this sort of, um, maybe a little bit of a caricature, but this famous or infamous slogan that has been talked about over many years, after Hitler us. Okay, I can speak to that. I actually looked that up, because I was really curious about that. And 
one could say it reflects the mindset of the German party, and there was one possible reference to it being said by Thalmann on the day Hitler was actually made chancellor. But the actual references I saw to that were from social democrats, not from the communist party. Now, one, it's still a crappy slogan, however, <laughs> to use it. But um, it was the most sources I saw were for social democrats. Yeah. So the, the question, though, that sort of lurking behind that is this, I'm interested in the structure. We have, part of the problem, I think, in this country is that the way the electoral system is engineered to exclude alternative voices. And so it, it pushes everything into this two-party duopoly. And, and what I'm wondering is, so my question has to do with the way the Cape Day um, played the political game prior to Hitler's election in 1933, if I got that right. And um, did they, you know, the criticisms of how they maneuvered within that electoral uh, system but the, 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 the crucially linked question to that is the very structure of the electoral system. If you could say a little bit about it to understand how it, how it is that they understood how they were trying to maneuver within that electoral arena, because the structure itself can sometimes push you in one or another direction. Well, the Weimar structure was much different than here. There was, of course, greater the, the chancellors could have greater powers than the, than the presidents as well. But there was also more room for smaller parties to get votes as compared to here and in many other countries. And unlike, I would argue, say, a lot of the post-World War II communist parties, a lot of the, uh, the, the German party, what, like the, their maneuvering in elections was essentially a way to gouge strength, to see what their support was. And through the Depression, it was steadily rising. And they, but most of their activity was done you know, in the streets. It was done in workplaces or unemployment lines and whatnot, various forms of mutual aid. I, they, as far as I know, they never contemplated anything like an electoral seizure of power. That would have been. But I guess the, the question really gets to, 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 to an actual election where Hitler was elected. Hitler was never elected. Never. He never gained a majority support, and it was through con it was through political maneuvering from conservative bourgeois forces in the Reichstag, along with alliance from the army, that he was able to come in. He was never elected in a free election ever. So there was never an issue of the Cape Day declining uh, in an electoral environment to support in, within a coalition kind of framework. Um, alternative that might have prevented Hitler's rise. I talked I think that's the critique. Yeah, I mean there it also takes two to tango. One can argue that their yeah. that their pol political approach was wrong, but the social democrats also were not quite willing to ally as well. There were some breakaways from both parties that tried to work together, right. but they were very small groups. But these two big parties and one could lay the blame on both if you want. <coughs> but they could not come together. And one could argue it was impossible. One could say, you know, maybe if Trotsky or someone else's text has been followed, something else could have happened. I can't say because I can't redo history. But Tilly, you can. Well, no, I was going to say, I, what you just said was very good. You know, interesting talk a little okay. bit, um, you know, on the factual stuff. I was just going, you know, what, what you just said about the two party of um, not being able to work together before on both pox on both your houses, <laughs> whatever. Um, I was just uh, going to say, uh, in terms of a popular approach, um, you know, there are two good Hollywood films. Okay, one of them was I, I saw as a child, and I wish I want to see if we can go, uh, if we can find it, copy here, was The Seventh Cross. Which was written by Anna, uh, based on a novel by Anna Seegers, uh, the uh, German communist who, at that point, had left and was in this country, and that was done during it was 1942, I believe. I I saw it as a child, and I really didn't, you know, it didn't quite strike home. But I saw other stuff at the time, <laughs> but. Uh, the, uh, but I did have, we've had the book here in the, uh, the center, mm -hmm. 
uh, it was public, and I suppose one could still get it off of Amazon. Well, you gave me a and if I can find day. it, I don't know. I don't know which box it's packed away in my house, but at any rate, uh, it was a great film about Nazi concentration camp of and taking place in the 30s. This was, you know, this was not about um, uh, this. And it was very specifically uh, about, I don't remember, I don't know how good the film was in terms of, you know, specifically saying communist, but certainly the book was. And, um, and it was published, I don't know, it was a literary guild selection or something, <laughs> believe it or not. The other one is Across in the Arrow by Alan yeah, Moss. I've heard of that one. And uh, I did not see the film, but the book is excellent. And now, you can correct me. Isn't this about a German worker who like paints an arrow paints pointing an to arrow where, like, a bombing target? Right. Yeah. Right. And that's an excellent one in terms of um, saying, you know, a pictorial history, you know, um, a painting uh, underground action, <laughs> worker, act, you know, communist worker action. He was one it, of the Hollywood Ten, wasn't he? Yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, personally, um, as I was telling uh, Sandy, a, a, a friend of mine um, who uh, came to this country after uh, the end of World War II, who, um, she was German and married a Jewish um, uh, survivor of the camps. Um, Kathy's father was killed in 35, 36. He was taken away. Uh, to the camps, and he he was not you. And this was you know this was political, and um, I believe he was a communist because this is uh, she was friends with us during the McCarthy era. <laughs> Something and, else, I, Peter. Yeah. I'll get to you next. But the other piece of uh, what you were talking about, um, I was raised. My mother went to Germany in 1930 with uh, some left wing. Friends, okay, and uh, she was appalled at the Nazis, and she, you know she was not left, believe me, <laughs> but she was appalled. You know, people kept saying, "Oh, they don't never come to power," and so forth. The uh, friends that she was with, um, I don't think they ever joined the party, but uh, they were um, staunchly anti-fascist and. What should I say? Uh, Scottsboro Boys and Sackley Manzetti, they did fundraising. You know, they, they uh, didn't believe. Yeah. Two quick things. Uh, Bertolt Brecht actually wrote a German Marxist playwright who had to leave in exile in the United States, actually, wrote an interesting piece in the 40s about the were the German people guilty of uh, Nazism. I can share it with people. Oh. but. Bertolt Brecht, Bertolt Brecht, which is a really interesting essay. And this was, of course, I think it was like right before the war ended. And an interesting thing I just thought of, since you brought up your friends who were in Germany, is the famous uh, historian Eric Hobsbawm was actually in Germany right when Hitler took power, and it was what radicalized him. And he joined, like, I think initially the German Communist Party, and then shifted his allegiance to the British one, which he stayed with until uh, it dissolved. Peter. Oh, this is just a point of information sure. in case anybody was interested. Um, I looked up the red referendum and apparently it failed. Okay, failed. I um, the Socialist Party, uh, so the SPD uh, stayed in control. Okay. Of Until there presumably, I mean, once Hitler took over, it was pretty shortly thereafter where he replaced the entire state system with gal lighters, you know, yeah, the Nazi Party right. rather than chancellors who were elected. Today, yeah, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Anyone else got? Well, John? Oh, yeah, I, David. Whoever didn't speak yet, maybe you should go. Okay, forward. then David, you haven't spoken yet. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to say I, I, did, I did enjoy your talking God out of it, but I was very disappointed that you quoted Trotsky so much. So who is one of the most discredited figures of the 20th century and that you defended the poom and I mean, because here, here in 
you know, in Boston, in the United States, it's like it's impossible to do any anti-war activism because most of the Trotskyist groups just like push, collaborate with the imperialists to push revolutions against con con every progressive government of every country from this like faux ultra left Trotskyite standpoint, and it's really it's impossible to do any political work to oppose imperialism because because we're, there are just so many of these Trotskyites around now. Nick, did you want to say something? Yeah, I just I wanted to um, emphasize that the Center for Marxist Education is a uh, non-sectarian space, and um, you know, talking about the, the threats we face today means um, coming to an understanding that we can have a lot of disagreements on the past. We can talk about these things, but in no way should um, you know, your stance on um, you know, a position of the German Communist Party or, you know, nuances of the Spanish Civil War. I mean, we have enough common ground to stand on today and, and focusing on, um, on on our differences um, isn't going to get us anywhere. I know for a fact we worked in productive relationships with Trotskyists in anti-war coalitions. It's happened. Um, it's just, it doesn't, dividing our forces doesn't get us anywhere. We have, um, you know, I, I'm in the Communist Party. It's a flawed organization. I haven't found an organization that isn't flawed. Um, <laughs> any group that tells you that they have all the answers is wrong right off the bat. If it's not flawed, don't join it because you're ruined it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I've been happy using this space. You know, I've been uh, volunteering here for um, a year and a half now. We have a lot of different groups come through. This is uh, what I hope we can. I, ho I, I hope we can build a lot more unity to fight um, the system. I mean, we'll, we have a pretty ruthless capitalist system. Um, yeah, right. It's not openly fascist yet, but the pro the forces are out there. There are um, armed militia groups. There are um, off-duty cops. There are on-duty cops. <laughs> um, um, there are a lot of um, the, there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, there's a lot of discontent and. If the left isn't bold with a with a vision, and if we look like we're just a bunch of squabbling infighters, right. um, we're, we're not going to win anything. Thank we're gonna, you. Um, you know, stick together. I saw Dana, then I saw you. Yeah. Uh, Franklin, there's a whole thing about uh, we have to hang together or we'll all hang separately. That's uh, pretty much what uh, <laughs> I strongly agree with what Nick was saying and also uh, the brother up front who's been talking about how you know, we really need unity among socialists and communists because, I mean, if you look at it, if you compare our situation, a lot of the historical parallels are obvious. There's a lot of people have said um, with the huge economic downturn, it's like we really are in great danger of a rise of fascism, and there are bits and pieces of it showing up throughout the world with like the Golden Dawn Party in Greece and so on. It's like there's some scary shit out there, but the difference between it, like in terms of socialists today and socialists back then, is that there are hardly freaking any of us. I mean, in Germany at the time, it's like you're talking about there were parties of well, like in the six digits of members mm -hmm. and in the millions of people voting for them, and we are nowhere near that. We like, so I mean, it really demonstrates how squabbling amongst ourselves is a really good way to um, ensure that we will get absolutely nowhere. And I mean. The, I think our primary task, I mean, a lot of people have spoken very well to how the two-party system that right now is very effective at sort of maintaining this ideology that it's like, oh, okay, you'll vote for, you know, these guys or these guys, and they'll change something. But those two parties, they're the A and B team of capital. They pretty much agree on everything that actually matters. And I mean, our focus, I believe, really has to be trying to get all of the people that we know consider themselves progressives to break with the Democratic Party and start thinking about other alternatives, whatever those are, whatever one of the like millions of little like, you know, like you said, the 57 flavors of uh, socialists and communists. It's like, I don't freaking care which party they join as long as it's one of us and, get, and getting the hell away from the Democrats and the Republicans and not becoming yeah. fascists. It doesn't matter. We need people to break with the Democrats, to break with that idea that th th those are the choices that you have in order to make any kind of political impact. 
and try and do something that will actually work. And whatever that is, and as, uh, as Nick said as well, I don't think there's any single party or group that has all of the answers. It's like we've each made our choices as to which ones we're best allied with. But nevertheless, I'd much rather have people joining a socialist organization, any socialist organization, than voting for the damn Democrats. Here, here. But wasn't the lesson you were trying to tell us about, about Trotsky and Nazi Germany that we should work with the Social Democrats, i.e. the Let Democrats? Me, I, what I was trying to do, and I, I know, I was just trying to lay out Trotsky's position because I knew when I started this that if, considering the audience that comes here, that would inevitably be raised about, because that's, that's the big criticism about this. And I just want to lay out as fairly as I could what Trotsky's position was. I don't care if people reject it or not, or accept it. I just thought it would, you know, it's something that should be addressed. And I, again, I'm not saying that if they, if you listened, I'm not saying if they allied with them that things would necessarily have been different. Maybe they would have, maybe they wouldn't have. But I thought, you know, considering that's a big criticism about what the Communist Party in Germany dealt with, I thought it should be addressed. Right. And you can uh, accept or reject it. That's that's uh, each person's uh, own particular business. But um, I actually considered using a rather obscure German communist to make the point. But I thought, uh, you know, just use Trotsky for it. Yes. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I I tend to agree with this woman who just spoke regarding about the, the issue of division and you said, you know, what you also brought up about the, con you know, the response ha about having to do with uh, the issue of Stalinist and Trotskyist. You know, I, I have to go back and to, and back to, well, I, I, I'm thinking about splits, okay? And I remember being, there being splits uh, in Chicago when I was there in the summer of 1969. The split between SDS, okay, that is the RIM organizations, there was RIM 1 and 2. That's I was there and I saw, and progressively I was there, I was a friend of PL, okay, so I was, you know, I was pretty, pretty thinking, I was thinking Stalin is like God on earth. I don't think that anymore, okay, and I don't think that necessarily Trotsky was bad, and he didn't deserve what happened to him in 1940, okay. Right. Okay, I'm, my thing is, you know, if you keep this split going the, with the anti war Vietnam War movement dis dis dissipated after a time after the war ended, and and it seems like uh, we have uh, Jesus said things. Okay, we have um, what do we what do we have now? Is we have a voluntary army now? Is that what happened? And we have women's lib has been combined into the imperial program, right? <laughs> women's lib we have women fighting yeah. for the empire, right? Yeah. Isn't That's that right. true? Yes. So yeah, I'm thinking about that and that kind of that sectarian split that you had, and and all I'm thinking I'm thinking also of the these wars that are going on, and I think also. Of I been I was there. I had a I have a half brother in Germany, and he took me, and he, he I think he really felt funny about it, but he took me to Dachau, and I saw the concentration camp, okay, and I, and it wasn't just, you know it was about it was it was also it was many manifestations. You had to do it was a political concentration camp, and then there was. There were the people who were inferior in, in Hitler's scheme. They were similar to the camp too. So, and you know what's funny too about it is, and, and because of the left being dissipated, destroyed, that the German Communist Party wasn't involved in the struggle at all. Who 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 manages that camp? The camp now, this museum. Oh, it's Israel. Oh, Israel's there. Jesus. <laughs> the, the, the people who were giving the talks were, were Israelis. About it was all it was about anti-Semitism. Okay, yes, that should be part of it. There were people that were also very big part. Oh yeah, and I'm saying also a big part about the about the about the people who were killed, the wiped out. You know, what about the gypsies? The I hear about yeah. the gypsies, and I, I hear about you know, and uh, and then you have uh, other people. Uh, you know, political dissidents. Social Democrats, maybe, too. 
They were, you know, they, these people were there. That's, that's what I saw. They taught, you know, and, and you know, I, for a while, I, I just had, this is, I'm getting off the track a little bit, but I happened to be there, and I, you know, and I'm, I'm looking at it, and there's a camp there, there's a little uh, house or something, and then I say, I didn't think it was much, and then I went around the corner, and then it went on down, it looked like it went down for about a half a mile, a mile. These camps, these little yeah. houses were there. It was, it was unbelievable to see it, in, just actually to be there and to see it. Uh, you, you, you see what's going on, and you know, the other thing, I just want to, I'm getting off again, and I want to try to get to the point. Further point is, well, the opposition, what's hap what do we have now? Oh, we have this issue, well, they keep talking about uh, illegal, aliens coming into the country from Mexico, you know, without papers, and uh, so they said to prevent that from happening off for detention camps, they've already set it up in Texas, right on the border, right, it's called Hutto. You heard about it? Hutto? And that is, it's perfect. I mean, if you, if, if this can be switched over from, resi you know, re resi uh, fr from keeping immigrants there, illegal immigrants, supposedly, <coughs> And uh, you just switch it over to people who are in opposition, labor activists, yeah. or opposed, who are fighting for, for trade unions or what are, are fighting against the war. It's, a, it's, a, it's very simple for that to happen, right? And then there's the other thing is the other thing is the resistance, and this is the, I think this will be the last thing I'll say. And this is about posse comitatus, the repeal of that law that was established in 1879. They had established to keep the the army separate from police. Well, now at oh. Ferguson, Missouri, you have yeah. you have well, you have these they have these tanks in there. I'm not I don't know if they're well it's some kind of tanks, right? Police tanks. Police tanks, right? And where do they get that from? The Iraq War, the Afghan War, right? Yeah. So that's it. And so it's all it's a, they're all pieces of the puzzle, and the puzzle is the big the big puzzle or the big package is imperialism, okay? Thank you. We gotta start that way. Thank you for Karen, sharing. Karen, I believe there's a comrade in the back who wanted yes. to speak. I'm sorry for... Um, I actually wanted to make a comment on what Dylan said just a moment. Is that um, the Nazi party and parties like the Nazi party uh, benefit when people turn off to the twin democratic... You know, they say, why bother? And then uh, the alternative of Nazism or fascism, et cetera, pulls up. But my real comment that I wanted to make and ask your opinion sure. on was in July of 1931 with the Red and Brown Alliance. Fast forward seven years and you get the Stalin Hitler pact. Yeah. So my, my understanding, I'm, I'm trying to get my head around the understanding of, in 31, was it clear to the Ger some of the German communists of, and those that were aligned with this is not a good idea, that coming down the pike would be something like this pact. Okay. Um, first of all, I, I don't think there was any, I think the German party, you can say they made mistakes, I don't think there was actually an alliance between them. They did, yes, they did vote with the Nazis to bring them down, but again, they were still killing each other in the streets. And in terms of the non-aggression pact, of 1939. Well, what about the Ch Hitler Chamberlain Pact of 1938 at Munich? I mean, if you one reads, I mean, there had been a various Soviet attempts to ally with Western powers. These Western powers had proven that they were more willing, that they wanted fascism to go east, that they had let this, they had imposed an arms embargo on the Spanish Republic, that at Munich part of the negotiations that they wanted Hitler to move east. So, and there had been attempts up through uh, 1939 by Stalin and the Soviet leadership to enter in some kind of alliance, which were rebuffed. So, if, I mean, one could say that the, you know, the, the pact was a mistake or a crime or whatever, but I'm just saying that there, it wasn't just like there's a straight line. There was a lot of other stuff that went along. There had been various attempts at collective security which were rebuffed by the Western powers. So, but come right here, stand up. No, um, it was a great talk, I really Thank enjoyed you. it. And, uh, but I also think we need to take a look at what was happening here 
as related to that too. Yeah. Because you had Ambassador Kennedy yes. from Massachusetts yes. negotiating with the with the, uh, the Nazis and labor and lobbying Roosevelt's administration to support the Nazis. And so there are things on both sides. And we can criticize the Soviet Union for their pact, but we're looking at it in hindsight. And governments make decisions based on their own interests rather than a collective interest. And I think that we have to understand that. We don't need to like it, but we have to understand it in viewing the history. Uh, that would be my comments on it. But I think that, that the, those pieces are also important to take a look at that picture because IBM, Chase Manhattan, all of these people were funding money in, and equipment Ford. into right. and Ford. I mean, Hitler read... The International Jew, yes. The one, Ford's not that, the Ford's, mass, uh, Ford's regular newspaper that came out. I forget the name of that. But, but he had a monthly paper that came out, which <laughs> was fascist. So all of this was going on over there, and IBM and Chase Manhattan were funding the Nazis during the war while during, we had during men. The, I was going to say, during the war while we had ships, men dying. Our ships were sunk because they were sending, the insurance companies were sending information to Switzerland that then got funneled into the Nazis. So, and people that, I mean, that, that's what I, I think, and I agreed with our comrades who were talking about, we need to put away a lot of this shit and start dealing with things together because yeah. It's the only way to gain power, but we also need to understand the system here a little bit. Right. Bernie Sanders, a socialist elected to the U.S. Senate, has to meet with the Democrats or his office would be in a toilet someplace. Well, because the system is designed to force independent thinkings and independent parties to collaborate with one or the other. Bernie Sanders supported Israel's war on Gaza. No, 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 I mean, I, I'm not, I'm I just, not, I'm not, I just want to point that out. I really hate yeah. him so much. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not supporting. No, I, I know. I know what you're. I know your point. It, and I just, but I. Just had to but say we that. need to realize that when we make our decisions. I understand. Thank you for sharing, Sandy, and then. So. So if I could just say one thing in terms of this country, I think the. And not just this country, but through World War, um, through World War uh, Two, that for communists, our fire should have been directed against our bourgeoisie. Instead, confidence was put in Roosevelt, and people went and fought an imperialist war. I agree with that, but. Well, I was just going to add. I really, I really enjoyed your your talk. And Thank when, you. I, when I think we, not put, I think what didn't come up was the, you know, was what 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 uh, what Nazism and Hit, Hitler was running. He was he was equating Bolshevism and being Jew. These were the two things that he was out to fight. And and that was the point where he got the probably got the help from uh, Vatican, who was who was very frightened of, right. of, of yeah. Bolshevism. So I think that's an, and that also comes in the context of talking about the alliance of the um, what happened thirty nine between the Soviets and and, uh, and Nazi Germany. I mean, there was this that that was his aim was to destroy. And I think uh, the pointing everybody east. It, it, his aim was to destroy um, Bolshevism and Jewish and Bolshevism became you know. I mean, he wanted to enjoy to destroy the Jews, but Bolshevism was his, his main thing was to go against that. Yeah, that, he the saw, trend that was coming from, from the East. He saw the Soviet Union, and, or Judeo-Bolshevism, yeah. as he called it, as yeah. his main enemy. Exactly. And it's no, it's, if one looks at how the war was fought in the Soviet Union compared to, or any, actually, of the Eastern countries compared to, say, France, it's a much, it's a, it's a horrific war. You know, it's like 27 million people died. You know, and, the, yeah. and then the fact things like the Vatican were on the side because they were also afraid of yeah, I just want to say, and it's a book I actually just started, yeah. Hitler's Pope. Yeah. There you go. Uh, first of all, the Catholic Church, they did sign a concord uh, with the, the Nazis to help them, you know, to make sure the Catholic center parties did not pose any big threat. And Pope Pius XII was a big supporter of Francisco Franco right. and everything. I mean, the, these people, you know, I mean, these were, these were very reactionary bastards and, you know, if you, I mean, Generally, I mean, one could say that they're, of course, they're progressive Catholics, but the 
the heads of the Catholic Church at that time were utter scum. And they deserve to be described as such. There you go. Uh, it's like John Cromwell. It was like it had a huge controversy when it came out. I think I think it's John Cromwell or something. No. But just look up Hitler's Pope. That's the book yeah. in the back. Gotcha. I just want to get people who haven't raised their hands. Oh yes, uh, you then you. Sorry. Well, in 1944, just after the war, just the war was finishing. There was a lot of Nazi movements had landed in this country, right around here, off the coast, up along the coast. New and they Jersey. were up by the FBI, had known of all this. And they put them out, and there's a lot of land that are living in this country right now. They should be dead, but there's a lot of them still here in orchards. They're, they were former Nazis, death camps and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, in terms, I mean, a lot, after the war, I do know that a lot of former Nazis like that ended up working for U.S. intelligence. Some of them, as, including in occupied France or these, they were considered to have skills in terms of hunting, you know, partisans and communists, and they were quickly employed. And of course, you know, we all, of course, all know about the rat line going to, like, South America and such. But yes, I mean, there was clear collaboration between, like, the U.S. government and former Nazis. Don't forget our whole space program. Yeah, and the space Yeah, the space In the back. So, of course, fascists are targeted in the Bolsheviks. Yes. Jews and Romani, so-called NCT politics and other That's right. So, because, because of all the decades since World War II, we've had progressive movements, we've had, we've had uh, social change. So, they can't target any, they can't target women anymore, women's movement so, so large. Uh, we can't target blacks or Hispanics. I know they do in, in the larger system, but you can't do it outright anymore. You can't target gays anymore. So who is it left? Who are they going to target next? Us, dissidents, anyone who stands up against the system. So I'm just afraid in years to come, if you speak out, that you will be targeted. Understand. That's a follow-up to that, because Carmen Ortiz, you know, our beloved attorney general, she's passing a, a legislation of a thought crime. A thought crime, you just think about a crime. You know you you know, committed a thought crime. You could be pers persecuted. The Nazis did the same thing. Just a simple talk, or simple rant, or just simple protest. You know you're not saying that, but it'll be considered a thought crime against the state. So it all comes down to what Ms. Ortiz and others are doing. It all has its origins in Nazi Germany. That's where we're heading at. I just, I just, I don't know if you already did this, but if you could just mention a few of the sources for information, sure. your research that you found to be most. Okay, I'll actually tell you probably, we don't, I wish I mean, we had to leave before. No, no, uh, the main book, and it's actually the same name as the talk, called Communist Resistance in Nazi Germany by Alan Merson, who was a, a member of the British Communist Party. This book came out in 1987. There's another book I use called like The German Resistance by Peter Hoffman. Various other general books and yeah, but those but if you if you have to pick one book, get Communist Resistance in Nazi Germany. Again, we don't have it here, you probably have to order it offline. That's the book. Uh, does it before I take you, John, is there anyone who has not raised their hand who wants to say something? John. Yeah, another book uh, you might want to check out is the one by Theodore Trepper called The Great Game. Uh, yeah, Le Leopold Trepper. Leopold, there Leopold, you go. I, yeah. Leopold Trepper. And uh, he referred to the Red Orchestra and what they were able to accomplish there. Well, he was the, the head of the Red Orchestra. He was a member of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. He was, uh, and he writes about, you know, how he was selected and, and sent over to Europe before the war. Uh, he was selected on the basis of opposition to Stalin's uh, policy at the time, and his boss, the, the, the head of the intelligence agencies, was executed uh, months after that, after he had uh, been assigned to Europe. But essentially, uh, he asked him point blank, do you think Hitler's going to invade? And he said, yeah. <laughs> he said, okay, we're sending you over. <laughs> 
And, uh, but that was against the party line at the time, as he outlines in his book. He was eventually captured by the Nazis, and, and he actually escaped. And uh, he, you know, he lived to write his book. So that, that's another interesting perspective that uh, you might want to read. Before, um, anything else? I got a few final remarks, I guess. But uh, I wanted to echo what Nick said. If someone says they have all the answers, they don't. Um, there's actually a, a good point, story someone told me. <coughs> Like, if you're interested in groups and stuff, look around, see what the programs are, and, you know, pick what you think is best, and you know, go with it. And always, of course, maintain a critical attitude and a critical spirit. You should be the best critic of whatever organization you're in. And in terms of fascism now in the U.S., I mean, there are definitely fascistic, or I would call maybe embryonic fascists, you know, certainly in the Tea Party. I think part of what historic fascism, and one can say, of course, you know, our conditions are much different than, than some, uh, some examples, is historic fascism generally takes place or gains mass viability once there's actually a left to oppose it, whether Italy, Germany, Hungary, and etc. And yeah, and in the face of fascism, you know, I mean, we're different, it's again different here, and certainly in opposition to this state, you know, we need to organize, we need to come together, unite, find common ground, unite with strengths to overcome weaknesses. We shouldn't forget, even, I wouldn't necessarily call this government fascist. I, I mean, it's a bourgeois dictatorship. And you can call it bourgeois democracy, but as Lenin said, you know, bourgeois democracy is still democracy for the slave owners. It's for the, the ruling elite. You know, they, st they still repress the left, they're still authoritarian, they're still imperialist. I, you know, whether they're, they're fascist or not, they're still capitalists, and they still need to be opposed. And our duty is to, to ultimately bring that system to its knees and cut them off, to destroy it. And the Democrats are not our friends, and just be, right. and the difference, I don't know about you, but someone who, uh, like a, a kid at the receiving end of a drone strike, probably doesn't care that the person pressing the button has a D next to their name. I mean, they're a bunch of murdering bastards, right. you know, that they have been the second most enthusiastic capitalist party in this country, who have a proven history of repressing the left from Woodrow Wilson to Harry Truman to Barack Obama, that they are not our friends, they have proven it, and that we should be absolutely opposed to them and building a political space independent of them, not subservient to their idea of what realism is, right. developing our own programs and ideas for action, and testing them out. Now, what those programs or ideas are, they should, again, not answerable to them. If they want to come over to us, that's different. But, but no, if you want to avoid liberal co-option, then don't take orders from liberals. <laughs> Yes. You know, we never talked about Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, Ella, she was the president, really, in this country. Well, One can make the case, sure. There's a little bit And we still get a lot of them out there like that. But they don't say it because they're, they're afraid to pressure that laugh that everything else. Okay, uh, before I wrap it up. We have upcoming events at the CME. There's a discussion on what is to be done Monday at 7, am I correct? Yes. You can hold on. Uh, I'm not speaking next month. We have Ron Jacobs, who's speaking as part of the 60 series, which one can, he, he wrote an excellent book on the weather underground, and he'll be speaking about that. I'll be here just to hear it. So I recommend people come. And we're probably going to have something in December on the second international. We're still working out the details for that. So that would be essentially the next Red History Lecture. But, uh, yes? You said I was going to have three minutes. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay, yeah. Practical action. Yes, okay. go, go ahead. Okay. Uh, this is the size of the postcards that will be delivered to whichever uh, unfortunate, whichever person becomes the uh, governor, the next governor. But basically, it's to, um, uh, to uh, uh, enlarge opportunity, there are certain parts of Medicare which would benefit people who are more have uh, incomes that are over twelve thousand dollars a year. 
um, and we're asking for those uh, benefits to be extended to people who have up to 35,000 a year. That's called 300% of poverty. Okay? I have agenda and I have postcards. And, um, yeah, give them, yeah, I will pass this around. Um, uh, take a, take one and please sign, give them to me. They will be collected and uh, we're going to leave stuff here. These are the postcards. Anything and, else? Right. And uh, I just want to say, why do it? Because right now, seeing the, um, the median income of seniors at this state is $18,000 a year. And out of that, the average health cost for seniors is $5,604 that they have to pay. I'm not talking about Medicare A that they don't pay for, but what they have to pay. Anything else from anybody on anything? Yes, Sandy. Uh, just on health care, uh, a week from tomorrow evening at 6 o'clock, I'm going to show the first half of SICKO. Folks, if you've seen it before, come on back and we'll talk about it. If you haven't seen it before, uh, you're mo more than welcome. Uh, the monthly newsletter of the uh, Health Justice for Boston initiative uh, is on the table up front. That's the September issue. We're working on the October issue at, as we speak. Where? Right. Here. Here? Okay. Here. Oh, you yeah, you. What's the film? That is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's Week from tomorrow. Week from tomorrow. Week from tomorrow here? Yeah, 6 o'clock here, yeah. Okay, just so Yep. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming to the CME for the, the lecture. You all asked some great questions. We had a good discussion. And if you haven't, again, sign up. Give us some donations if possible. And stop on by when we're open. Thanks, Doug.